Let's write an assembler. Again. There is some method to the madness here. I have been working on this operating system called CPM65. It's a port of the venerable CPM2602 base machines. And here it is running on an emulated BBC Master. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of software for it. In fact, there are these four commands. Uh, Asm.com, I will get into later. It's the thing in the window over here. So there's not really a lot of point having it if you can't do anything with it. There is an Asm file on the disk, which you can type, but you cannot actually assemble it. So it desperately needs an assembler. In addition, when I was designing CPM65, I made it use relocatable binaries because CPM systems are uh, very uh, unhomogeneous. So having simple memory images that load at a fixed address would mean you'd have to rebuild everything for every platform. And I'd also dramatically underestimated how difficult it was to generate relocatable binaries. So our assembler needs to both run on CPM65 and generate CPM65 binaries. Now, I have done assemblers in the past. They've always been very heavyweight disk-to-disk -disk assemblers, which use like proper parsers, and uh, they do multiple parsers through the source code, reading it from disk each time. And it works, and they're quite memory efficient, but they're also excruciatingly slow. Uh, reading and writing from the disk at the same time on a system with no buffering means you constantly have to seek backwards and forwards across the disk. So I am going to, today, prototype a different way to do assemblers. We're going to do a RAM-based assembler. However, unlike the traditional CPM assemblers of the past, uh, which generate a simple memory image at a fixed address, we're going to have to generate a relocatable file. So this is going to be interesting. So I've got here a, it should be, one of those. It should be that, uh, a boilerplate program written in C that compiles for CPM65. Um, I want to add apps to that, and then it will build. It's been compiled with uh, the 6502 port of Clang and LLVM. It then generates a uh, CPM65 executable and bolts it into the uh, disk images. So we can run it through this emulator. It doesn't actually do anything yet. Uh, it opens the input and output files and it just copies stuff from the input to the output before closing it. But we can demonstrate by doing hello.asm out. Don't know if you can hear the disk noises, but you can hear it seek backwards and forwards. Uh, that's because oh, I haven't saved that file. Okay. So you can see that this is showing that we have 22 odd K of memory with no actual program. However, I'm not going to use the emulator, this emulator to test with because I have written a user mode emulator with a debugger in it. So I can just run asm.com like this. Uh, in this emulated environment, we have loads more memory. And uh, if I do, here's a random file, and it should have done it. It has copied this file to this file. Uh, the size is a bit different due to the way CPM does blocks. So all we need to do is just fill out the rest of the assembler. So what we're going to do, I've been thinking about this, is 
read the source file and parse it, construct in memory a data structure representing the source file, we can then do multiple parses through that data structure before writing the result from memory to disk. So we read the file once and we write the output file once. The uh, we do not have a heap. All we have is an array of bytes from uh, here we go from CPM RAM to RAM top. So the this value is just what you get from the difference between those. So that's our available workspace. We're going to have to put into this all the data that our assembler is going to need. So including symbol information, uh, information on the, uh, the instructions we've actually read, and uh, label information that we're going to use to actually generate the, uh, the resulting machine code. We're going to make some simplifying assumptions. So we're not going to support the uh, where did I put the here we go. So this is the test program that uh, should be assembled with I think uh, LLVM MOS. We're actually going to change the syntax to make it easier to parse a little. I think this is actually all perfectly fine. So we're not going to be fully compatible with the existing assembler. It's going to be simpler. It's not going to be a macro assembler. It's not going to support stuff like arbitrary segments and so on. Also, for the purposes of this prototype, we're not going to support full expression parsing. So an expression is going to be either a constant number or the address of something plus or minus a constant. This should allow us to uh, demonstrate that the thing works. So the place to start is always with these things, the lexer. What this is going to do is read symbols well, read words from the disk into a parse buffer. We wish to save memory. So because we know that we are that parsing and writing the result will happen at different times, we can reuse the output buffer as the parse buffer. So we're going to have a function that reads a single word from disk into the parse buffer. Okay, so that was the really boring bit. Now we have to start actually thinking about how things are going into memory. And the way we're going to do this is uh, we start at uh, the bottom of memory and we're going to call this top and we are going to write a series of records I'm just trying to think of syntax. Right. Right, this was the bit I was interested in. So we're going to write a series of records. Represented by 
guess. I do want this to be a struct. This will contain the length of the record, because this will then allow us to walk the list to find specific records. This is basically going to be like a sequence of uh, instructions that basically each instruction will turn into one of these. Um, We are going to so the simplest record is just going to be a sequence of bytes. In fact, we don't need that at all. So uh, one of these records means emit these bytes as a literal into the output file. We will be using this for uh, constants like this. Also instructions that do not contain any interesting parameters. We know as soon as we see it how this is going to be encoded. We do it like this so that we don't end up storing masses of information trivially. This, for example, we don't know how message is supposed to be encoded until we see it, which happens later. So that we're going to have to store this as a reference to something. But this is just bytes. Now for these, this is going to be an instruction with a variable reference or rather an instruction with an expression uh, I said earlier that expressions can be a constant value a label plus or minus constant we're also going to have to add high and low so So what this is going to go in, what this is going to have in it is the opcode and the expression itself that is going to be a pointer to the variable. And there's a reason for having it as a uint 16, which I will explain later. And the offset. And and also I have completely forgotten that to go alongside the length we are going to have to have um, what kind of record this is. So in fact, we are going to uh, encode the
we're going to encode the record type and the length into Desker here. All right. So what are we going to do for parsing? So this will be a loop that will, it will attempt to parse instructions from the input stream. So this is actually fairly straightforward. We need to read a token. Did I make that a char or a blue and eight? It's a char. Okay, if it's and the file stop. Um, I got that union all wrong. I'm going to have to re, uh, go look at that again. But anyway, so the things it can be at the beginning of a line is a instruction. So that's an be an ID. or eventually a dot pseudo op. But at this point we know that Yes, I know I used to go to. It's because you can't break from the for loop from inside the switch statement. That is perfectly allowed. Okay, so we know it's an ID. What we're going to have to do now is to go look at the uh, the contents of the buffer and try and do something with it. So essentially we can need to find out if it's an instruction. If it's not, then we know it's a symbol reference and, you know, just do the appropriate things. Um, let me see. Otherwise, give up. Those warnings are because we have to do that better. Okay, let's go look at these records again. Now, what I did wrong here was that I made made this a union. What this means is that the uh, the outside record is going to be the largest of the union members in length which we do not want because we want to tight we want to pack these tightly that's why i did that in fact let's just do So this is going to be a minimal record. This is going to be our bytes record. And 
Can I do that? This is going to be our expression record. I can do that, nice. Oh yes, and one more. That. So, once we've finished parsing, we want to add a EOF record to the bottom of the list. So this is going to be very simple. So, so this is demonstrating how to add a record to the, uh, the buffer. So if we build that, we run it, that's not working. In fact, we don't need EOF record, we can just do this. So we get unexpected token here because it's just read an ID and we don't have any of them. So if we actually copy this to a new file, we just put LDA9 in it. We get a... I forgot to do a thing. Um, comments. Now we're going to use the backslash character as a comment, which is relatively standard in places. So if we get one of them, we just want to keep reading until we hit a new line or the end of the file. So... Okay, that should be all we need. So if we take our test as an and we comment out that line, then nothing should have happened because it should have read one token, which is EOF. We got a 59, which is a semicolon. Oh, it's the end of line. Okay.
that's fine, we just go around again if we get one of them. That means we've reached the end of a statement. Good. So we've now successfully parsed our empty file. So we can now say Right. So our end of file has given us one stored byte in memory. We are now going to have to start thinking about actual instructions. So let's put that back where it was. Let's go for a, a RTS unexpected token. Right. So over here I have a table of the 6502 instruction set. Uh, this is not sorted by opcode. The uh, it's sorted by instruction encoding. The fields of an opcode are divided into these. Uh, each opcode byte is divided into three fields, A, B, and C. Um, B is used mostly for the addressing mode, while A and C, these two fields here, tend to describe what the opcode actually is. So, for example, LDA is uh, C equals 1, A equals 5, this row. You can see all these are LDAs, and the B changes according to what addressing mode they are. So, in order to parse an instruction, we have to read the instruction so, for example, in our case, that was a LDY, no, an LTS, of course. Uh, in hindsight, that's not a brilliant example because this has no addressing modes. So let's pretend that was an LDA. We read the fact it's an LDA, but then we then don't know what opcode it really is until we read the rest of it. This does actually simplify parsing a lot because you notice that all these instructions except for STA here are very similar. They all follow the same model. So we only need one routine for dealing with all of these except for STA which is nice. So instruction matching We are going to So we're going to have tables of instructions. So These are going to be, uh, each one of these is going to contain three characters worth of opcode and one byte worth of payload. So for the simple instructions, we've got brook, which is a zero, PHP, which is 08, Uh, not that CLC, which is one eight. Not that, not that, that. And you notice there is a pattern here. I think I've missed two zero. Ah, that is not one. Uh, SEC is three eight. RTI is four zero. 
PHA is 48. CLI is 5.8. RTS is 6.0. PLA is 6.8. SCI is 7.8. That one PYA is nine eight. Uh, what's eight eight? Eight eight D Y. T A Y is A eight. And the next one will be B eight. Uh, B8, CLV. No, no, yes, C8, INY. CLD, D8. E8, INX. SED F8. Okay. Um, I should add the reason for these patterns is because uh, this the the opcodes were all very carefully chosen to make it easy to implement in the silicon. So uh, all of these values will be wired to the various logic gates that basically cause the uh, processor to do do the right thing. Oh, there's more. 9A, that's an exception. And there's these as well. But these are actually part of the logic op instructions, so I don't want to implement them right here. Okay. So we need a function to actually match one. Uh, really, we want to return the op code. But we also want to be able to distinguish between a, mat, a proper match and a failed match. Uh, FF is illegal, so let's return that. And we also want to tell it where to stop. So this is going to be a helper that, given an instruction table, will scan the, uh, the table attempting to match what's currently in the parse buffer. So, we just want to make a few slight adjustments. 
So we're going to store the token length in a global. Okay. I don't think we've got to lower. We've got to upper, but not to lower. Fine. Let's just use uppercase. Okay. So for each opcode, or for each one of these, This will generate decent code. I don't think it's worth unrolling this. Uh, I don't think it's worth turning this into a loop. Okay, this means you've got a match. So we return the opcode value. Otherwise, go on to the next one. Therefore, otherwise, it's a illegal instruction. Like so. Right, now we want to do something with it. So if, the reason why I wanted the token length to be public is that if the token length is three, then this might be a, uh, an opcode. We know that if the token length is not three, then it cannot be an opcode. So, This is actually going to be the address of the last array member. So we're going to have to define length of. To be total size of the type divided by the size of a t the member of a type, the member of the type. So if the opcode is not illegal, this means we have found an instance of this instruction. So we're just going to print it for now, and then we continue from the. Uh, we do not continue from the top. We now want to 
match a new line. So we're just going to do a break. So here we're going to want to read another token. And then we go around again. So now if we run it, ah, right, <laughs> it printed 96, then it printed one bytes of tokens. So 96 is six zero, which is Where's RTS on this table? This is the wrong table. Okay, high six zero RTS. Good, it's the right one. So output byte is going to do the work of adding a bytes record to the to top. I'm going to want to be reasonably smart about this. This is going to add a record of the appropriate type. This is going to emit a simple byte. The reason for doing it like this, oh yeah, and I also need to change this to be add record. F. Then add record takes care of advancing top. So Now the reason why we're doing it like that is, let's put this over here, we are going to keep track of whether there is a half completed byte object on the at top. Um, yeah, we can do better than this. We okay, so we're going to wipe all our memory from RAM top to. So all our RAM will be initialized to zero. Okay, so when we add a record, we are actually 
going to look to see if is there a bytes object on the top of the heap? If there is, and there is free space in it, each record can be 16 bytes long. Hang on, hang on, I'm doing this wrong. Uh, this conditional actually wants to be down here. Okay. If there is a partially completed record, if there is a partially completed bytes record on the top of the heap, then we take the length, we advance top. and we update R. So this will skip past any half completed record and return a new record. If, so when we want to omit the byte, if the thing on the top of the stack is not a bytes object, do we have a bytes record, byte record, Desker. If it's not a bytes record, then it's going to be nothing. Therefore, add one, which is of zero length. If If the if the length of the record is 15 bytes, then this record is full and we need a new one. So we actually want to do this again. So this is going to be Like so. This will then create, if, if the thing on the top of the heap is not a bytes record or it's full, create a new bytes record. Then get the length. Write the byte, increment the length. Right. So what this should do, when we do emit byte, it should create a new bytes record, put the byte onto it, and then when we get down here, add record will close the bytes record and append a EOF record. Bad token 12. 12. Let's see. That's not so great. That suggests that, in fact, we've corrupted something. It 
has not read any tokens. Uh, if I get rid of this mem set, does it get better? Yes, it will get better because, in fact, RAM top is the top of memory. We want to start writing here. There we go. Two bytes worth of tokens. That's not right. That should be three bytes. So what this should have done is it's added a record of zero length. So it hasn't advanced top at all. Well, it's advanced it over... It'll advance it over any previous record, but there aren't any. It creates a record. This should then write a byte value to the right place. Um, that should be a one. All records must be at least one byte because of the Desker field. So this should now give us three bytes. Two bytes? Ah, right. That's not working because this is actually advanced top by one. Which we don't want to do. So in fact, we're just going to do that to bump the field correctly, to bump the length correctly. Right. Three bytes of tokens. Good. So I think that is working. How are we doing for size? Uh, could be better. So we are now emitting simple byte operations. We now... Uh, we should actually probably... dump this. Um, okay, that's actually just going to dump the, uh, the records buffer into the output file so that when we hex dump it, we can see that that's an octal. Why is that an octal? Here we go. So here is our records. Two, uh, the type is bytes. It's two bytes long, and that's a zero. That should not be a zero. That should be a six zero. Well, and I think so ninety six is there. This is our end of file record, is 0, 1. Oh. One byte long of type 0, meaning EOF. Here. Yeah. 
So this suggests that it's writing to the wrong place. So the first time through, we add a record of length 0. We bump the length, so it's now 1. This will be 1, 1 in memory. We write the value. Ah. That's why, because I forgot to take into account the length of the record header. There we go, 1260. And if I change my ASM file to put another RTS in and run it, Six zero six zero, which is exactly what I want. The reason why I'm being so uh, anal when it comes to combining bytes records is I expect to see quite a lot of these, and we want to make storage of raw data as efficient as possible because there's going to be a lot of it. But okay. Let's go with um, full ALU instructions. So these are uh, this column, essentially. I need to find that table again. This one. So that's going to be these. Luckily, there's not very many. So, ORA, O1, and 21, your 1, ABC, 61. SDA is a bit special because, of course, it's uh, write only. So, trying to store a store to a immediate makes no sense. We'll, ign we'll ignore that for the time being. LDA A1, CMP C1, SBC E1. Okay, so if it's not a simple instruction, and one thing to think carefully about. So I'm passing in the start and end of the table here. The extra code needed for passing in the end of the table and doing the comparison here, it may actually be faster and smaller to waste an entry at the bottom as a terminator. So, you know, if the first character of the opcode is zero, then just give up. We'll look at that later. Um, In fact, this is going to be ALU because that's going to define the uh, how we're going to change the opcode once we have resolved the argument. So here we actually want to parse the parameter. I wonder if there's a way we can get away without it for the time being. Anyway, let's just go.
So we need to pass the argument which will put the result of this somewhere. Then we're going to add our record and copy the stuff in, whatever it's going to be. We can reuse the same type for lots of things. So this parse argument is going to have to record what type of argument it is so that it can correctly set B And also, if it happens to be one of these, or a reference to an absolute address, which it knows directly, then it actually wants to emit bytes. So looking at this table, there's actually some annoying exceptions. So... For the ALU instructions, immediates are at B equals 2. For these, it's B equals 0. So we're going to have to have multiple argument, multiple parse arguments routines. So this is actually going to be parse ALU argument. And this is going to return B. So the cases when we actually want to change the addressing mode after we resolve all our symbols are basically turning absolute values into zero page values. Uh, zero page values take one byte fewer to encode. Also, we're going to have to emit relocations for those. So we don't need to do it for this, because these are always two bytes. Or this, or this. And in terms of instruction encoding, this is identical to this. It's the opcode byte followed by two bytes. Likewise, this is the opcode byte followed by one byte. So in fact, we can turn one of these into one of these by just clearing a bit, and it's always the same bit. Uh, it's the bit with value Two. It goes from uh, 111 to 101 or 011 to 001.
So that is in fact So that is going to update the opcode to be the complete opcode. Pars ALU argument is also going to have to decide whether the argument that's just been parsed is a simple value, like one of these, or one of the others that uses a constant, or a complex value which requires the full expression record. So we're going to have that's going to be a reference to a variable or and value uh, actually actually value offset can be stored here in token length so that's going to be that token variable. So if token variable, this is a reference to something that's using a variable. Otherwise, it's a simple value, and we can do this from bytes. So init byte opcode, emit byte token value low byte, emit byte token value high byte. And let's just hack this to be token variable equals zero. Token value equals E. Now run it. Four bytes of tokens, and what did we get? Nothing, because I forgot to actually put anything here. So that's going to be LDA and nothing. We haven't that, we're not actually parsing anything yet. Unexpected token. Break at the end to indicate that this is the end of a statement. Seven bytes of tokens. And we have a single bytes record containing RTS. A1 is LDA one of the LDAs, followed by our parameter, followed by another RTS, followed by EOF. Excellent. Okay, this is beginning to make progress. And the size is, eh. Right, the next thing to do is to actually start parsing things. Actually, before I do that, I said earlier about uh, using terminators here rather than a end pointer. Let's actually put that to test. How big are we? 2407 bytes. So if we Will that work. I've taken a break and all my windows have moved very slightly. Okay, that should add an empty element and that should add an empty element. So that should have put us up to uh, 24, 30, 30, 15. Yep. So this now becomes
like that. And like that. How big are we? Quite a bit smaller. Yes, interesting. Let's just reformat everything. Okay. All right, let's have a look at parsing things. Uh, let's go for... Um, hmm. Let's just add a another helper here. Should go here actually. Static. That should be a char here. Just reading a character from the um, from the input stream. And that should be a char and. That is not a char. Okay. So we're going to do peak byte, which is very simply read byte push byte r return r. Because in our passcode, we are going to want to figure out what we're looking at next. So. If it's a constant value, then we do read it and we read in a constant. And then we return the B value for constants is two, and we want to shift it left two. Okay, bad addressing uh, mode. This is going to be read token. C is not a token number. We are going to extend this to deal with variable references later. That will have put the value into token value. So that should now work. Let us change this to LDA one, two, three. Now this is actually going to do the wrong thing. Unexpected garbage at end of line. So what is it complaining about? It should have fetched our constant. And that has put us at the end of the line. Hmm. Also, I'm actually going to need to change this a bit. So 
And the reason why, actually I can do this slightly more cleverly, is that uh, we only want to permit a single byte of payload as constant bytes if it's this column. We might want to extend this in the future to this column and this column because uh, assuming these are returning uh, known constant values. In fact, we do. So if B is 1, 2, 4, because this has to be in zero page, it's, it, there should be brackets around it, but this table doesn't show them. 1, 2, 4, or 5. So in fact, the only places where we don't are 0, 3, 6 or 7. It's four of each, that's convenient. Let's stick it like that for now. So, where are we getting this? Unexpected garbage end of line is actually here. Three five, that's a hash sign. So we must have been through here. not been through here. It has not found our instruction. Did I get this wrong? out okay so it is searching for LDA in ALU instance should have found it huh that is wrong that should be in some name zero. There we go. So bad addressing mode has not seen the hash sign. I uh, got a space. Yes, okay. That's because we're peaking a byte rather than an actual token. So we're going to have to do this differently. So this will read and consume a token. So if it's a hash sign, it's already been consumed. Therefore, expect constant will have to read another token. If, however, it's a 
ID or a number, then we're going to have to deal with it immediately. Anyway, this should solve our immediate problem. There we go. We get A9 hex 72. Let's change our test file. DE, that is not the right number. Yeah, that is very not the right number. That's our FE. Okay, our Lexa up here is That will probably do better. Um, misconverting character into a digit. Still wrong. starting with token value as 0, which is correct. We multiply it by the base, which should be either 10 or 16, and we add on the digit. This entire expression is, is bogus. Okay. To do it this way round because we're going down in numerical ASCII order. So at the top is lowercase, then we have uppercase, then we have digits. Oh, 05, right. That's not 5D. So the D is very wrong. So C minus A here, if this is lowercase a, then D minus A will be four plus 10 is 14. Or oh, um, 13. Five D. Okay. Right, that is moderately incompetent, but still kinda but now it is kind of working. Oh all right, so if it's a number then it must be this form, this form,
or one of the x indexing forms. And if we go up to the other table, this also does not show the correct uh, num the correct mnemonics. Uh, ADC should show them. Here we go. Right, indirect is yeah. If okay, if we see a natural number, it must be. Zero page, zero page, comma x, absolute, absolute x, absolute y. But it cannot be indirect, anything with a parenthesis, or an immediate. So go back to our original table. So this is indirect. This should have parentheses. This should have parentheses. But none of the others do. So if this is if we are seeing a number at this point, this will eventually become a parsed expression, then it must be one of these. So the next thing we want to look for is a comma. I am not sure we can do this without adding look ahead to the parser. That is being able to cache a token. I don't want, really want to do that because you can't. It's it, it's like unwieldy in the cache to uh, cache these things as well. So I think we're actually going to have to. Do that. Because we want to say, is the next token a comma? If it's not a comma, we don't want to consume it. aware of is that peak token will actually update various token variables. So if the next thing is a identifier or a variable, then it will overwrite the number that we've just read here. But in that situation, uh, it's going to be bad anyway, in invalid. So let's just peak it. If it's a comma, then it's going to be one of these forms. So we want to know whether it's comma x or not. If it's not, and the value is small, then this is a zero page form, this one, that's b equals one. Otherwise, it must be in the abs form, b equals three. So, if it is a comma, then it must be an X or a Y. If it's not,
then that's a failure. The token length must be one, or is this not an X or a Y? this let's go for this one if C is the token ID and the token length is one then we look to see what the value is if it's an X this is the uh, ab, uh, this one, abs or zero page, comma x. Zero page comma x is b equals five. Abs comma x is b equals seven. If it's a y, then it must be b equals six because there is no zero page comma y option. Otherwise, it must be bad. Did we get errors? We did get errors. That should have a return in front of it. OK, so let's edit our test file. So we have LDA, yeah. so that has actually produced A555, five, five, five. oh yes we did not modify this stuff down here. So, uh, zero page, zero page, that one byte, one byte, one byte, two bytes, one byte, one byte, two bytes, two bytes. So, so you want three, six, or seven. A555, AD, EE55. So A5 is LDA zero page, AD is LDA abs. Good, that is working. So let's go for that. Right, expected x or y. So, I mean, there's plenty here. So 
So I think we got to here. Oh, I know what I did wrong. So we have peaked the comma, but we haven't read it. So we do want to read it. Good. So we have LDA E55, BD3412, BD, abs comma X, that is correct. B9, 2143. Uh, B9, yeah, that's abs comma Y, that's correct. B5, 1, 2. Uh, don't think that's right. Oh wait, that's the end of a bytes record. So yes, B5, then we start a new record, 1-5. That is the wrong value. Uh, zero page comma X is this one. So it's got the right opcode, but it's got the wrong value. Followed by B9, 2-3. O O, which is correct because this is the 16-bit abs form. There isn't a zero-page version of that. Oh, hang on, no, no. Um, B five one two is the opcode, followed by the the operand, the address, the zero-page address. Then we get the bytes record. Then we get B92300, RTS, end of file. That is working. Okay, right. The next thing, indirect. This is this form, or this form. Um, and the syntax is not entirely obvious. Yeah, x comma ind has got the parenthesis around the whole thing. Ind comma y does not. So we consume the parenthesis. No, we've already consumed the parenthesis. We now need to read a number. Let's just change that to read number. It's not a constant. You can use an expression there. That puts the value into token value. We now read the next following token. It can either be a closed parenthesis or a comma. So if it's a closed parenthesis, then the next thing must be a comma. And here, in fact, 
if it's not a closed parenthesis, then it's going to, again, it has to be a comma. So this should read the X or the Y. I think actually I'm going to do, put some helpers in. So this is going to return a uh, if it is x or if it is y return otherwise produce a error. So this then gets simplified to expect x or y. And we know it cannot be anything else. So here we can say C equals expect X or Y if C is not. This is close parenthesis, comma, y, so it's this. So this has got to be a y. So we know that this is now this column, which is b equals 4. Right, this one round, we have the comma. Then we have the X or Y. This has to be an X. Therefore, this must be this one. We need to consume this close parenthesis. Oh yeah, and after we have done that, we need to uh, consume the close parenthesis there. All these expects can be commoned out with a great deal of ease. Yeah, Clang doesn't know that fatal does not return. And probably, there's probably an attribute for that. Okay. So where is our print i coming from? We've got some debug tracing. That would be not there. Here. Here.
so. Right, that looks like it's worked. Just double check. Uh, B112 is. B112 in direct comma Y. Uh, A123. A1 in direct comma X. So let's just put a this in. See what it does. Bad addressing mode. Yep. And let's change this to a number. Expect it X or Y. Good. Uh, yeah, we're going to put line number information in eventually. Right. So this gives us parsing constants in ALU operations. We're also going to want to put labels in and symbols. So let's go down to here, parse. So if it's an ID, then it's an instruction, and we go down the instruction code path. If we reach here, then we know it's not an instruction. Therefore, the only thing it can be is a symbol definition. But yeah, it can only be a symbol definition. So we have the uh, currently the parse buffer contains the name, so we need to add a symbol. We haven't done anything to do with the symbol table yet. So that's just going to uh, That's just going to add a symbol. Does actually symbol? Okay. So record management, symbol table management. Our symbol table is going to be really simple. What we're going to have, let me actually just define that, is, hmm, actually, and I might change my mind about what I was going to do there. So what I was going to do was have a record which contains the symbol type, the variable value of it, that is, if it's referring to another 
symbol, the offset, and the next symbol in the chain. This allows us to do a, a fast backward search starting with the most recently defined symbol. This will be important when we want to implement scopes that will happen a lot later and probably not in this video. The other thing we could do is to walk the, the records forwards starting from the bottom of memory. This means that we don't need a next variable. It means that looking up symbols is slower because we have to look at every single record but because we're walking the chain in that direction, we can't implement scopes by simply uh, moving last symbol here to the last symbol of the previous scope, thus making all the symbols defined since then uh, inaccessible. Okay, and of course, the name. Let's leave it like this. Oh, and let's make these all packed. On the 6002, you shouldn't need any alignment, but I have observed that uh, LLVM MOS will occasionally two align things, which is kind of strange. So we take a look for if there are no symbols to find, then we don't find anything. Okay, we start with the last symbol. Get a pointer to the symbol. Ah, sudden thought. Sudden thought. Our records are limited to 16 bytes. The record header contains 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that means we get 8 byte symbols, which is not enough. I can change this easily enough. We don't have very many types. Three bits will do. Like so. We then also do need to go through and change a whole bunch of OXFs. So that actually wants to be an E. That's a one. Okay, that means that a record can be 32 bytes, so 32 minus 8 is enough. record name. So this should get the length of the... Do we have an offset of? We should. Uh, 
is a pointer. Okay. So this gets the length of the string that we want to look up. If this is different from the token length, then it's obviously not the right symbol. So we only need to actually do any kind of comparison if they match. And to do the comparison, we are just going to parse buffer the name and the length. Okay, this means that we have found our symbol return R. Otherwise, go to the next one on the chain, just like that. So in fact, we're going to change this to, while S is not null, iterate like that. Right, adding a symbol. Uh, if it already, if there is already a matching symbol, don't add it. There's also going to be a separate maybe add. Uh, right, then is going to be the length of the token plus uh, actually the length of the token plus the overhead We can then add a record, which is going to be a record symbol ord with length. We copy. name in and the fields inside the symbol will automatically be initialized to null. So we have now correctly added, created a new symbol. We now need to know what we're going to do with it. To do that, we need to look at the next token. If the next token is a colon, we're defining a label. The symbol needs to be initialized to the current program counter. If it's an equal sign, this is a normal variable. So we're actually going to read a number. And initialize the uh, this needs to change to expect value actually.
like so. And in fact, I've forgotten the bit in add symbol. Which is We need to initialize, uh, or we need to add it to our linked list. this going to work. Let's get rid of our instructions. We're just going to keep an RTS in place and we are going to define a value. Right, I forgot to put equal signs into our Lexer. Unexpected garbage at end of line. So we should have read the number. We have read and consumed the token, which is the ID. We then read and consume the thing after, and then the number. Oh, end of file. Uh, that is a valid uh, expression terminator. Okay, 18 bytes of tokens. So, uh, 2260 is our bytes record, with two bytes in it, followed by 6D, which is a symbol record. Uh, 00, 0 is the variable reference, 0, 01, it's easier to see, is the value, which is 1. Followed by uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Flags. Oh, yeah, okay. Flags, variable reference, value, next symbol, name, F N O R D, byte record, RTS, finish. That looks good. So the next thing is, uh, well, we've, we will have various different types of symbol, such as label definitions that will be defined to the current program counter. Uh, label definitions where we have not seen the label yet, 
constant values, like this one. I don't think there's anything else, actually. That's nice. Oh, uh, and we also need to keep track of what memory area the variable is referring to. So it can be in zero page or in the main memory uh, or be an untyped constant. We need those in order to uh, generate relocations. And that will be done there. Um, the other thing is we're actually going to need to start parsing these. So these expect numbers should actually turn into an expect value. So if it's a number, then it's a number. If it's an ID, then we need to look the symbol up and return a variable reference. But I think I'm going to do this next time because this is a multi-part series. I don't want to make these too ridiculously long. See you next time.